Hello, I'm Lloyd Albright. Thanks for stopping by to visit my YouTube uh, podcast, which I've entitled Lloyd's Commentaries and Stories. You know, sometimes when I sit out on the, on the front porch or back porch and, and uh, think about things, I sometimes uh, come up with some, uh, some interesting things that I feel like sharing. And so what I'd like to share with you today goes to something that my grandpa said one time years ago. He said, you know, a man can become so broad-minded that he becomes flat-headed. <laughs> now, what exactly that means, it puts a visual in my head. It kind of kind of gives me a headache. But, uh, you know, uh, the question that I want to ask as a result of this little narrative that I'm doing today is, <clears throat> how does a man become flat-headed? How does he become an absolute fool? You know, I went to school in my brother's place one day, and uh, you know, I learned about some interesting people. Uh, one of those people uh, had a few things to say that was very that kind of answered the question that my grandpa brought up about flat-headed men. Uh, the man's name was Jean Piaget, J-E-A-N, like Jean, only called Jean, like French. Jean Piaget, P-I-A-G-E-T. Jean Piaget was a Swiss psychologist. Uh, he specialized in the study of, uh, of young children. Piaget, Piaget discovered from observing children, he noticed that, that uh, children from a very early age uh, begin to build little building blocks or structures in their head, like little houses, you know? little houses. Uh, he called them schemas. Uh, not a scheme, but a schema. A schema is like a little blueprint or a diagram, so to speak. Uh, that even from a very early age, little children began building those in their head as, as new information is inputted to them. Now, a little baby in the cradle there, you know, he, know, he knows nothing. He's like a sponge. But very quickly, this information starts to enter in. For example, <clears throat> let's just say a two-year-old um, that's just now learning to talk, as a lot he still doesn't know, uh, he's introduced to the family dog. And so he sees that the dog has four legs, the dog's fuzzy, and the dog um, has two ears. And, you know, uh, he learns what a dog is. You know, when the dog comes in the room, uh, you know, Junior will say, hmm, a dog. Sounds like one of those old Indian movies, don't <laughs> Dog. Well, a little bit later, along comes the cat. Cat walks in the room, and Junior looks at it and says, Mmm, a, a dog. <laughs> well, no, wait a minute, Junior. We have to explain to the baby that, uh, you know, it does have four legs. It's very much like a dog, but it's different. The cat goes meow, and the dog goes woof woof. And as we go along, Junior keeps seeing more things. He sees birds. And he looks up in the sky and he says, birds? Then a little bit later, he sees an airplane and he looks up at the airplane and he says, bird? <laughs> and so we have to teach him about airplanes. And these, these little things start to enter in and he starts to build these very, very tender and sensitive structures in his head by which he understands the world, the way things are, the way things are supposed to be. And as he gets older, even into old age, uh, he continues to do that. We all do that. We all continue to input information. Now, in the case of the child, again, you know, uh, there's a, there are a lot of variations. He eventually sees a giraffe or he sees a bear. And all these variations, they all have four legs, they're all fuzzy, but uh, you know, he builds these schematics in his head by which he measures the new stuff that's coming in. And so when we do that, we all have these schemas in our head. And sometimes when we see something new uh, through our five senses, 
that does not fit in with that little house, that little schema that we have built in our heads. Uh, if it doesn't fit in, it, it causes a little, uh, a little ripple that Jean Piaget called cognitive dissonance. Cognitive mean brain or mean thinking, cognition, and uh, dissonance, a little nervous Twitter there, you know, a little nervous. Cognitive dissonance. It's very much like when you're sitting by a quiet pond and you throw a rock into the pond, you'll notice it makes, it makes ripples. And so uh, those little ripples, we, it's, it's hard to live with them constantly. It's like a little, but we do, we all live with them because we constantly have new stuff coming in and it, it keeps us, well, mama used to call it being out of sorts. It kind of makes you feel out of sorts. I like big words, so I like to, I like to say I'm feeling uh, discombobulated. I like discombobulated. But anyway, cognitive dissonance is what it is. And when we encounter something new, the first thing we do is we run a search engine on it. You know, comparing our brains to a computer, we would type in a search word for that, you know, giraffe or bear or whatever, to see if we have something if we have a space on the shelf or a, a, a file label to where this new information might would fit. <clears throat> so that's a very simple thing. If we get new information and we have a place for it to fit, we just slide it right on in there. It agrees with what we already believe. And so, uh, uh, you know, no, no problem, no fuss, no muss, you know, no ripples. But then other times we, we encounter new information that doesn't fit so well. Now, if it, if it doesn't fit just a little bit, maybe, um, we can maybe whittle it down or uh, tweak it a little bit and make it fit. And that's what most people do. If it doesn't automatically fit the schematic that they have in their head already, then they'll, they'll tweak it a little bit and, and make it fit. And that's what we all do. We try to make truths that we discover. We make it fit within what we already know. Now, as we build these structures, they get more rigid. They get more parts to them, and uh, you know, so that when something comes in that doesn't fit, it's a lot of trouble to make it fit because we've got a uh, you know, it's like doing a renovation on your kitchen. You got to tear some stuff out. You got to maybe change some things. You got to make a change in order to what Piaget called accommodate. To accommodate, the first way he called assimilate, that we try to reach out for new stuff and assimilate it into our existing structure. That's doable. That gives us a little ripples every time we have something and we make those adjustments. But when we get something big, something new and different, that causes um, more than a ripple. Sometimes it can, it can be a tsunami in our brain requiring change. Now, Lord forbid, nobody wants to change. So when we encounter information that is different from what we already believe, and that's typically the case, uh, we talked in a, in a recent commentary about politics and religion, how that um, uh, two subjects that most of us like to stay away from because we differ. And we all are very rigid in our belief of how our politics go or how our religion goes. That's, that's the structure that we've built. That's our schematic. So when somebody comes along with a different idea or a new idea that's, that's different from the structure that we've already built, uh, it causes more than a few ripples. And so we tend to reject that and, and throw it out. But uh, Piaget, <laughs> had a little blank on his name there. <clears throat> I wanted to say Papa, but Papa didn't say this, Piaget did. Piaget came up with this term, accommodation. In order to grow and develop in our lives, we have to, we have to from time to time, make changes. Sometimes the structure that we've already built has a flaw in it. It needs to be changed. And so when you get information, whether it's from 
say, a, a religious perspective from somebody else or from a political perspective that, that we don't agree with, or many other things. I'll give you an example of accommodation. Let's say that you've got a little, uh, you've got a little music group that specializes in uh, bluegrass. And, uh, you know, they're not very popular. They're just playing in the garage and they do a few gigs here and there. So uh, they want to get better and better, but they need a fiddle player. So they find this local fiddle player, this little young lady that's really good. I mean, she's like studied, a she don't call it a fiddle, she calls it a, a violin. She studied the violin in school. She's won competitions and boy, she is quite good. So she comes over and auditions for the group and they listen to her and they look at one another and shake their head and say, boy, she is really good. I, I, I'd love to have a player like that in our little group. I mean, she's way over us, the best I've ever heard. But there's only just one little problem. She doesn't fit. <laughs> you know, this type of violin that she's playing, that's not good old bluegrass fiddle music. That just won't fit in our band. But let's just say that they stretch to accommodate. They say, well, we'll give you a try, but you know, we are a bluegrass band. So she comes in and she starts hitting those classical licks and she just listens to that bluegrass, but she starts to infiltrate, you know, some of those classical notes and so forth, until before you know it, she has turned that little bluegrass group into a whole new sound. It's a whole new sound. And before you know it, they've, they've done got a whole new sound. Uh, they got a hit record and uh, they're rich and famous. Now, I can tell you a particular group that did that. There was a, a country group They've been around a long time, called the Oak Ridge Boys. Most of you know them, they're old guys now. But the Oak Ridge Boys started out for many years as a gospel singing group. And uh, they had a lot of fans, you know, in the churches and so forth. But, uh, you know, they didn't make that much money. And after a while, their travel expenses and all that, they just weren't making any money. And so they decided they might as well go ahead and, and disband. And lo and behold, a friend in the music business came along and said, no, y'all are just too good. You know, you shouldn't disband, you shouldn't quit. What you need to do is just make a little change. I suggest that you take that sound that you've got going there and change to country music. <laughs> well, to the boys, that was a little bit of a revolting idea that didn't, didn't uh, fit in on a shelf or a or a folder too easily. So it required them to make some changes, but they did. They stretched, they accommodated, and they made those changes in their musical repertoire. And boom, before you know it, they were uh, uh, rich and famous, uh, a great singing group, very popular, and uh, made a lot of money. And so that's what can happen. Now it can happen to you and I as well. Uh, when somebody introduces a new idea, let's say a new food. Now, I'm an old country boy here from Alabama, and uh, I kind of like to eat beans and cornbread, and uh, I don't vary my diet a whole lot. And so, you know, I don't like trying new foods too good. But I can't tell you how many times my wife has prepared a new dish, or we've gone to a restaurant and saw a new dish, and I gave it a try, and wow, it just turned out to be one of the best things I ever ate. New movies. You know, sometimes uh, my wife has uh, dragged me kicking and screaming to one of these romantic comedies. And, uh, you know, what I like is, uh, you know, some, some good old car crashes and some fighting, some kung fu fighting. But I would go to these romantic comedies with her, and lo and behold, that movie would turn out to be one of my favorite movies on my, on my movie list because I gave it a try. And so, that's what happens to us when we accommodate new things and sometimes it requires tearing down a few things like renovating the kitchen or the bathroom. It requires tearing out a few of those old things. Now, people uh, find it easier to assimilate so accommodating is a lot harder than assimilating. Now, people who are get too rigid with their schemas and they won't change it they think they know everything that's worth knowing, so they just won't change. They won't try a, a new fiddle or a new music sound. 
they won't uh, listen to anything new. They won't go to a new movie. Uh, some of these old boys down here in the south live in little old rusted out trailers with their boots in the floor and and, uh, and the toilet unflushed and uh, the house is dirty and the bed's messed up and uh, because they wouldn't change because you know what when you take a wife when you bring a woman into a marriage uh, you know a guy's got to make a few changes you know now she, when she comes in she's gonna put some pictures on the wall She's going to cook you some really great meals. She's going to kiss and hug with you at night. It's just going to be wonderful. But you do have to make some changes. <laughs> you got to get your boots out of the floor. You got to start flushing the toilet. You got to start using some deodorant. <laughs> you got to straighten up. Now that's hard. Change is hard. So most people do not like to make those changes. But unfortunately, as we grow older, and we get more rigid in our ways, these rigid structures uh, make it harder and harder for us to, to accommodate new information and make these changes. Now that's, what's happened, that's what, what happens to the old boy who uh, wants to assimilate everything and doesn't want to, uh, 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 what was the word, accommodate anything new. He ends up in that old rusted out trailer. Uh, but what happens to the person who is accommodating? Well. You know, you can't accommodate everything because what happens when you start accommodating everything, then you, that's, what, that's what makes a fool. You don't really have a rigid structure. It's so darn flexible that every new idea that comes down the pike, we want to accommodate. We're seeing that in our society today with some of the social ideas that have come along with all this LGBTQ stuff. Uh, you know, uh, that, that we're, we are accommodating right into our movies. Uh, I mean, I get tired of trying to watch a movie, you know, about a bunch of firemen uh, that are hugging and kissing one another. I don't want to see that. I can't fit that into my schema. These two good looking masculine guys kissing one another. I can't deal with it. So I'm sorry, but my schema is a little rigid and uh, I can't assimilate that. And I refuse to accommodate it. Right? But people who do accommodate, okay, that's okay. I'm not a gay basher, so I'm, I'm people for having, having rights. But now we're going into transgender and stuff like that where we're trying to change the gender of a child in school through the, through the book literature, through teacher counseling, where the parents aren't supposed to know about it. Hey, this is all new stuff now. I'm not for it. I can't accommodate that. But you know what? A lot of people are accommodating it. They are accommodating it. We're seeing it all over the world now. Well, what are those people? Well, I think Jean Piaget might would call them a fool. What Papa might would call it is flat-headed. When we start taking in more stuff than we can deal with, and we, and we got to take it in, you know, because you got to throw it out or you've got to accommodate it because those little ripples, they get, they get more and more. They get bigger and bigger. They turn into big, big waves. And uh, that's when people go crazy. That's what we call crazy. That's when they're called neurotic. Neurotic people, always biting their nails, always twitching and thumping their fingers and pacing. People get neurotic when they get these ripples. That's when they're trying to make a decision that they can't make. Trying to make a decision about your love life. You know, should I marry this girl or should I not marry her? Should I date her or not date her? Or, uh, you know, what to do, what to do. And that's when those little ripples, that's called cognitive dissonance. Remember that word. It'll be good for you the next time you go to a cocktail party. You can try it on somebody. I can almost guarantee you they won't know what it means. Cognitive dissonance. Assimilation accommodation if you accommodate too much and you don't and you don't scrutinize it now assimilation that can make you narrow-minded and that can make you stupid as well but it can also sometimes be the very iron rod that we hold on to in order to keep our lives stable and on track hold on to that iron rod that way when stupid stuff comes along all the garbage that's continually trying to get into our minds through the, the TV set or through the radio or 
just from stupid people that we know. When that tries to get in, don't let it in. Throw it out. Don't be a fool. If you become a fool, then that's what Papa would call flat-headed. And that's exactly how a man becomes flat-headed.